Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me in this great opportunity to discuss about the platform economy and the future of work. Well, here uh, I will share my reflections on the Indonesian experience over more than five years of working in this topic. Well, in this picture, you can see there is a man who looks tired, overworked while doing his job as a delivery guy or as uh, riders of online taxis in Indonesia. And I think this picture could represent the worst scenario of the future of work in the platform economy. Why I chose this picture to begin my discussions? It's because I think everyone could enjoy a good future scenario. But if we can embrace the worst scenario and take into account what will be the risk of the future, we can be more prepared for anything that will happen in the future. So in this talk, I will share three points. First one, what makes me optimistic about the platform economy in Indonesia? And the second, what makes me pessimistic about it? And the third one, what do I think about the future of work in the platform economy in Indonesia? Well, the first point is that what makes me optimistic about it is throughout working in this topic for the more than five years, I observe that the trend of digitalization in the platform economy in Indonesia has successfully scaled up the informal economy in Indonesia. And these trends, I think, could bring more uh, progressive and important uh, impact into the social and economic development in Indonesia. Well, if we in Indonesia, informal economy, or now the gig economy, if we understand gig economy as a service from a door to door service, I would say that this kind of gig economy has long been existed for decades in Indonesia. And now the, the introductions of digital platform has somehow scaled up the way the services being uh, operated from motorbike taxis, from grocery shopping, from waste collections, or even from cleaning services. And this kind of scaling up uh, the informal economy has also been globally recognized quite recently by the Queen Maxima of the Netherlands, who gave her remarks in the G20 side events at 30 October 2021. In her remarks, she said that Indonesia is one of the inspiring examples on how digital platform can uh, improve the financial inclusions for small medium enterprise. In her remarks, she mentioned Gojek as a right hailing app, which used digital ecosystem to help small business to digitize their inventory management, marketing, payment, credit, and sales. And now suddenly these small medium enterprises are connected to a larger world. And many of them become leap forward and expand their business beyond their brick and mortar presence. Another example on how um, uh, the optimizations, uh, or how I feel optimistic about Indonesia's platform economy is from the number of mobile internet users in Indonesia. If we look at it from 2017 until 2020, we have in 2020, we have at least 176 million of mobile internet users, which is a very large uh, numbers for uh, mobile internet user. And from this amount, 81% of mobile internet subscribers have adopted digital payment via mobile wallets as of May, 2021. And this adoption is higher than in other countries in the region, such as Singapore, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And if we look at from the investment sectors, according to a research by Google Temasek Bain Company in 2021, the investment value of Indonesian digital economy during the first quarter of 2021 was 4.7 billion US dollars. And this number has exceeded the highest value for the last four years. 
This achievement makes Indonesia the most popular investment destination in Southeast Asia, even surpassing the Singapore as the neighboring countries. So what, this, uh, this kind of achievement of platform economy in Indonesia makes me very optimistic about the futures uh, of platform economies and also futures of work in Indonesia. But of course, this story is not a fairy tale story. There are also some weaknesses, challenges, limitations that Indonesians uh, in Indonesia happen. And that leads me into my second point, what makes me pessimistic about it. <clears throat> of course, there are many um, critics, uh, concerns about the platform economy in Indonesia, even from economics, social sector, political sectors, et cetera. But one thing that makes me very concerned, and I think it's become the main puzzle in Indonesian platform economy is that on the business model of this platform economy, which I think at the moment, it's tend to informalize a job rather than trying to embrace and bring more inclusions of informal workers in the digital ecosystem. And I think this, argument is also has been resonated with, with a lot of uh, research that has been uh, conducted in Indonesia. One research, for example, is from Frey in 2020, in which uh, it says that the, there is a wave of informalization of job brought by this platform economy globally. But she mentions that uh, in what makes it very specific in Indonesia or in the near South is that this kind of workforce who live in precarious condition and unprotected work has been uh, has long been the norm in Indonesia even long before the platform economy existed. So what does it mean? I think it means that the, the introductions of platform economy could worsening the precarious and unprotected working conditions of the informal workers in Indonesia. And I'm not trying to make it more scary, but the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, has even uh, bring more detrimental effect toward the working conditions of informal workers in Indonesia. According to data from uh, Bureau of uh, Central Bureau of Statistics of Indonesia, during the COVID-19 in 2020, at least there is 3.84% of population quit their job because of the pandemic. And it's also resonated with the data on how the numbers of informal workers from 2019 to 2020 is increasing from 70 million into 75 million, while the total workforce in Indonesia in that year is around 135 million. So it's almost more than half population working in informal economy. And if we don't do anything to try to, in, uh, to try to improve the conditions of informal worker or trying to increase the mobility, the vertical mobility of informal worker. This will become the biggest homework for Indonesia uh, laborers uh, uh, and also workforce. A report from Fair Work Indonesia in 2021 also shares similar um, working conditions on how uh, platform workers' working condition is not really good in Indonesia. If we look at from the score, most of the platform has less or at least five to less score from the Fair Work Report that also include a very long hours uh, per week and in average 70 to 100 uh, hours a week, no fair contract, no fair representations uh, for the workers' organization, only uh, less communications policy and also less protections worker policies. So and uh, despite all of this, uh, working conditions of 
platform workers that I think I also found there is a misleading strategies shared mostly by this platform company. What kind of strategies? I found that usually most of company will advertise their platform job by using the how many income they will get per month. And usually this income will be a, will quite big income in compared to the formal work. Like for example, Gojek compare a uh, Gojek over 10 million rupiah per month in 2015. And also Octopus, which is a platform company in waste collectors, also uh, advertised that you work in our company, you will get at least 10 million rupiah per month. And quite recently, Air Asia also do similar advertisement. And what is actually misleading into this advertisement is that this advertisement not only attract the informal workers, but it also attract the non-informal workers who who wants to have a, a steady income, who wants to have a bigger income, like the 10 million uh, rupiah per month. So that did make that, it makes a more difficult competitions for informal workers to enter the platform workforce, especially those uh, group of informal workers who don't have access to mobile phone, who don't have access to the internet, who don't know how to operate the digital platform, this group become very vulnerable and will most, like, most likely they will be neglected in the platform workforce. And I think um, this also resonate with my current uh, research and publications about the conditions of drivers or uh, on, of online taxi, where during my interview, I found this metaphor of drug addictions uh, metaphor. So in the interview, I tried to ask how do they feel about their working conditions. And one of the representations of uh, drivers told me that their life is looks like a drug, uh, like they having this drug addictions. Why? Because at the beginning they have this higher income based on the bonus and everything, and then they decided to change their job of online taxi from part time to full time. So now they they depend on all of their income from these online taxis, but. As you can see in the interview, he said that first we got comfortable, but over time, the dose or the bonus of becoming online taxi drivers added juice and we become addicted and dependent. So now this is our main income and we don't have many exit options. So I think if we keep doing the same business as usual in the platform economy, this drug addiction metaphor will inevitably become one of most likely future scenario of the future uh, of work in the platform economy. So now I'm talking a lot about futures scenario. I'm going to my th third points is on the future of work. What do I think about this future of work? Well, I would like to share my ongoing project in my PhD studies, uh, where we're trying to find a way to have a more collective imaginary about the future of work. Because personally, I think, uh, when we discuss about how uh, what is desirable future of on platform economy, it is not fair to only uh, hear to only listen to those powerful actors and technology company to determine the future of work. I think we also need to embrace to listen any stakeholders in the platform economy and take into account their imaginaries to shape the future of work. So what do we do? Here we have three possible scenario of online taxi in Indonesia, which is the transformation, where in the next 10 years, we imagine that online taxi will become the main uh, services in Indonesia, where people use it every day for daily use. And then the second, uh, 
uh, scenario, this optimization where we imagine that the online taxi service will exist hand in hand with the public transport services. So online taxi services will only function as feeders or the first and last mile commute. And the third scenario is on decentralization, where we imagine that there will be more uh, local actors growing in Indonesia, where the, the local government act as the supporter for, for these uh, local players. So we offer these three different scenarios to each of the stakeholder, which is the policy makers, the, the driver organizations, the user organization, as well as the expert in digital economy and expert in transportation. And we ask them how pessimistic they are to each of the scenario and how optimistic they are to each of the scenario. And the result that we found is that uh, from the three scenarios that we offer, they feel most optimistic to the optimization scenario, which is on the middle. But if we look at the length of the bar, uh, it's uh, the length of the bar represents the level of uncertainty. So what we can see here is that in, in general, the stakeholder more, feel most optimistic with the scenario of optimization, but they also still have high level of uncertainty toward the future uh, of these optimization scenarios. And another finding, we also found that there are four different uh, future scenario because during the interview, we also trying to invite our respondent to give another uh, future scenario that they think will happen in the future, which is <clears throat> these four scenarios are technology leapfrogging, autonomous vehicle, Jakarta as the pilot for innovations, and the uh, online taxi as the substitution. And what also uh, another important finding that we found is that talking about the future of work, we also need to unpack what makes uh, the scenario of optimization become uncertain for all of our stakeholders. So what we found is we're trying to unpack the criteria that they think will somehow shape the future of platform economy in Indonesia. Here we found 19 criteria that we categorize into four sectors, which is in economic sector, the government regulation, social, and technology. These 19 criteria is actually resonate a lot with the current debate that is going on about the future of platform economy or debate about the online taxis in, in specific. Like, for example, take into account the category in social, the criteria of labor exploitation, health, pensions, insurance, driver organization, consumer organizations, gender empowerment are actually similar with the current protests uh, that is still that is going on uh, by uh, and driven by the driver organization. These criteria are actually uh, the criteria that they demand the government to take into account and make policy to improve these conditions. So well, what I also interesting that I found is during our interview, it's quite interesting to see from policymakers, for example, there are zero social criteria that become, how to say, a price, uh, a factor of appraisal for the policymakers. And for drivers and users, there is no criteria from technology sector, which means that for society, for drivers, for users, community, discussing about economic impact, social impact, and how the government regulations protect their right is much more important rather than discussing the future of technology itself. I have so many things to discuss, uh, so many insights uh, actually from this finding, and I would love to discuss it with you later on on question and answer, but I would like to close my talks today by talking about by by taking uh into account what i wrote in my ongoing project about the futures imaginary my current conclusions shows that how the future imaginaries are never purely about particular technology but more about value and expectation of the that technology to fulfill 
And in my study case, in our study case in Indonesia shows how the non-technological aspect are more prominent than the technical aspect in the articulated socio-technical imaginaries. Thank you for your attentions and looking forward for having a fruitful discussions with you.